Good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm Bob Wachter. I'm chair of the Department of Medicine. And uh, uh, today, uh, go through a couple of the grand rules just real quickly, and then we'll get on to today's really exciting session. Uh, CME will be available. If you're interested, stay on at the very end for instructions. Um, closed captioning is available. As always, we will post this uh, Grand Rounds on YouTube in a few days. Um, and uh, uh, encourage you uh, and your colleagues to look at it there if you don't have a chance to those that don't get a chance to see it live. Um, and please, if you have Q&A, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we will get to as many as we can uh, toward the end. So uh, really looking forward to today's session because I think one of the most interesting and important questions for all of us uh, in uh, all parts of, uh, of the medical system will be how do we integrate new digital tools and methods into improving the way we deliver healthcare. And one of the leading lights uh, here at UCSF and really around the country in thinking about those issues is uh, uh, one of our uh, cardiology faculty, uh, Rima Arnout. Uh, while much of her discussion will be on uh, AI and machine learning as it applies to uh, cardiovascular imaging, I think what you'll see is that this is relevant to the way we think about imaging more broadly in medicine and ultimately to the way we think about uh, all of the things we do in healthcare as, uh, as we learn to use all of this digital data in new and novel ways to make care better and safer and more equitable, more accessible, more satisfying, and hopefully less expensive as well. So really important uh, crossroads that we stand in, and Rima is really one of the leaders in helping us think about these issues uh, with a particular focus on cardiology. Her title today is AI for Computational Imaging in Medicine, uh, Promise, Pitfalls, and What's Next. Uh, Rima is associate professor uh, in the Department of Medicine. She's a Chan Zuckerberg Biohub investigator, and she also has uh, appointments in the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute, the Biological and Medical Informatics Program, and the Center for Intelligent Imaging, all of them here at UCSF. Uh, she is looking, as you'll hear, at the role of machine learning and AI uh, to uh, improve the way we uh, interpret biomedical imaging. Uh, in a scalable fashion, decrease medical errors, and undercover uh, or uncover new phenotypes for precision medicine. Uh, Rima did her undergraduate degree at MIT, MD at Harvard, residency at Mass General, and we were lucky enough to recruit her uh, to the cardiology fellowship here at UCSF and ultimately to the faculty. So uh, Rima, why don't you come on and uh, look forward to hearing your talk and we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. Thanks. Uh Thanks, Bob. And uh, let me just uh, work on sharing my screen here. Uh, let's see. That's good. All right. Can you see my screen? Got it. Okay. Uh, well, great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here today. And uh, and thanks, Bob, for the introduction. Um, let me just uh, adjust a couple Zoom items here. All right. Uh, so as Bob mentioned, I'm an adult cardiologist. I'm an imaging specialist on the clinical side. Um, and I'm also a researcher at UCSF. And I wear uh, some hats at the institution and nationally in terms of developing uh, machine learning for medicine. So uh, these are the learning objectives for today. We're going to talk about machine learning for medicine, uh, specifically imaging. I'll give some examples. We'll discuss some pitfalls and how uh, uh, people in the field are trying to get past those. And finally mention different ways where physicians of all kinds can and should be involved in machine learning. Uh, so I'm gonna focus on machine learning's uses for imaging, as I mentioned, because especially in medicine, a picture is worth more than a thousand words. It's key to diagnosis and management across medicine, across modality, it's deceptively easy to learn, uh, but it's actually really hard uh, and it's data rich, so it's worth it. Uh, this is one example, uh, would, have looked, would have looked like a Rorschach test to me on my first day of med school. Um, it's actually a pretty data rich image to me as a cardiologist now. Uh, it's ultrasound, so we're imaging uh, structure and function in real time. And I can see that this is an M mode of the mitral valve right here. Uh, there's significant mitral regurgitation happening here, and that MR is in late systole, so it's likely from mitral valve prolapse. So I have anatomy, uh, severity, pathology, uh, location, mechanism, all in one image. <clears throat> uh, so I read in the echo lab uh, probably about once a week, and I'm reminded every day uh, that I do it that 
you know, we're it, right? Humans are still the best tool we have to acquire and interpret medical imaging and turn that into clinical action. But to err is human. So we can be inaccurate, especially when the finding is complex, rare, or subtle. Our reads, you'll be shocked, but our reads are not always completely reproducible from reader to reader. Uh, we have trouble measuring even simple things such sometimes like chamber size or mass. And then there are other observations which are even harder to quantify. And then finally, as humans, uh, we can only read so many images in a day before we get tired. And these four things are real shortcomings in image-based phenotyping for both clinical use and for precision medicine research. Uh, and these shortcomings have to go. We need more from image-based phenotyping for echo and across medicine. We need accuracy and reproducibility delivered at a population level speed and scale. Uh, and when you are made to help turn artisan work into accurate, scalable work. And that's what my lab and others are trying to do. So from here on out, we'll follow this structure. The first question is, what is machine learning exactly? I know you've all heard about it and probably several people in the audience are quite familiar. Uh, but for those who may not be, I'll give uh, what'll hopefully be a quick and painless overview of some basic concepts. Uh, so the first thing, in contrast to traditional rules-based algorithms, which apply rules that we make up to data, machine learning algorithms learn patterns from data. And the contribution of the data and the algorithm together give rise to a trained machine learning model. And that model is what gets evaluated in terms of performance. There are several types of machine learning algorithms. Uh, neural networks are one type which are especially useful for complex nonlinear data, uh, which we often encounter in medical imaging. Now, learning can be supervised, unsupervised, or semi-supervised. And that distinction refers to what kind of training labels are supplied along with the data. And I'll get to that more in a minute. And finally, machine learning can be used to solve different problems. Uh, generally, these include things like classification, you know, uh, here, here's a pathology slide, is this nephrosis or nephritis, you know, uh, segmentation, you know, here's a brain CT scan, now trace me the contour of where the brain tumor is, uh, and sequence prediction. Uh, this patient was discharged uh, from the hospital in XYZ condition. Show me what that's gonna look like in 30 days. Uh, since neural networks are so important in imaging, I'll give an anatomy lesson about them. So neural networks are named that because they're loosely modeled after the brain. Uh, this connected, uh, collection of connected blue circles is a cartoon of a deep neural network. So. Each circle is called a node, and those are akin to the neurons. The nodes are all connected, so that's where you get the word network. And then we arrange these nodes in layers, and we stack them. Uh, and that's how we get the term deep. So that's how you got deep neural network, uh, or deep learning is, is kind of synonym. So remember, this is just an algorithm for finding patterns in data. It's a little bit like the brain of a newborn baby, it's designed to learn, but it doesn't really know anything yet. Uh, so now we're gonna feed it some data so it can start learning patterns. And we'll take an image, we'll break it down into pixels and feed that into the neural network. Uh, this is a cartoon of supervised learning. So each image has a training label. Uh, each node in the network takes in some pixels, computes on them and outputs some information to its neighbors. Those outputs are weighted synthesized across the entire network into a prediction. And then that, that prediction is measured against the training label. Uh, so the training label can be something literal like ventricle if it's a picture of a ventricle, uh, or the training label can be something abstract like Timmy risk score three or diabetes. And we just keep giving the network training data with training labels and the network keeps computing on new data keeps comparing its prediction to the training label, keeps adjusting those weights, that information, right, that, that's being computed again and again and again and again. And along the way, uh, different layers in the network might start to see 
different types of image features. So early on, it's probably a very simple uh, image feature, like vertical line, di diagonal line, that kind of thing. Uh, later, deeper in the network, it might be a higher order image feature, like a ventricle. Um, and this detection of higher order image features, it's what allowed neural networks to work better for images than a lot of other algorithms, a lot of other machine learning algorithms. Um, those other things kind of never really get to see an image as more than just a collection of pixels. Uh, so anyway, you keep training your model with more and more data. Um, and then finally, the network is trained and one can give it never before seen test data and evaluate its predictions. And we can rely on the electronic health records, clinical reports, clinician experts for validation. Um, at this step, at this stage, uh, this type of evaluation is, you know, no different from any other clinical research. Um, you're saying uh, there's a new method. How does it compare to the standard? What's the sensitivity, specificity, number needed to treat, derivation, validation cohorts? So all of that science is brought to bear at this stage. And I just showed you a basic example of a convolutional neural network for image classification. Uh, but beyond that, there's this whole world of different neural networks. The types of nodes that we choose and how we connect them together allows us to build different networks for different types of data and different tasks. You can even use an ensemble of different networks together to solve different steps of an overall problem. Uh, so as I said, the example we just walked through was supervised learning where each piece of training data had a label just like the answers in the back of a study book. But, you know, what if there is no label? What if your study book didn't have an answer key? What would you do? Uh, well, you'd kind of stare at the data and try to notice some useful uh, patterns and groupings the best you could, um, and that's unsupervised learning. Another scenario, what if labels are sparse? So the red one just went missing. Uh, or what if you have the wrong label sometimes? Um, those types of situations are examples of semi-supervised learning or self-supervised learning. And those learning approaches are really useful because we recognize that getting perfect labels for a large amount of data is hard. It's, gonna, it's only going to get harder the more data we have uh, we bring to bear. Um, and this is true, especially in medical imaging, where there can be subjectivity in interpretation and measurement. So two problems, the labels can be suspect and we all have day jobs, right? We don't have time to do this. Uh, so the next question you might ask is, okay, that was great. You know, when will we be seeing these at work in the clinic? I think that's a common question people have. Um, partly, I think a lot of machine learning is already here. Uh, where it appears in industry, sometimes it's hard to tell because their solutions are proprietary and involve a mix of neural networks and standard techniques. Um, but here are some situations where it's already happening. Um, these are emerging successes. Uh, things like detecting brain hemorrhage uh, in a CT scan to help physicians triage which CT scan they should read first. Things like detecting diabetic neuropathy, especially in resource poor settings where there aren't a lot of ophthalmologists detecting malignant skin lesions. And this was an early use case in the field. Uh, and detecting coronary calcium from a, a regular C chest CT scan. Uh, and you probably will see this now on some CT reports right here at UCSF. Uh, and of course, uh, the use in, in ultrasound has been right along. Uh, my lab was among the first in the world to apply deep learning to echocardiography which is a very, very noisy, very variable image modality. Um, so it's an interesting thing to me from a clinical perspective, because I'm a cardiologist, we use echo all the time. Um, but it's also really interesting from a technical perspective, because in a lot of ways, if you can do this stuff for echo, uh, uh, you are that much closer to doing it from, for any image modality. So uh, early on here, we used it for view classification, that's a foundational step in interpreting echocardiograms. So, you know, here's some examples of views on the left. And then here are a bunch of images color coded by view and plotted in high dimensional space. So each of these little points represents an image. And you see that uh, the raw images don't cluster by view at all. 
but after deep learning, they do. Um, and this was a fun project. There are a number of cool things about this paper, but there's also an important caveat that you know, didn't escape my, my key notice, uh, as they say, um, which is for that paper, we used about 200,000 images. Um, but anyone who's visited the Echo Lab with me or, or come down to review an image, uh, any of you guys can figure out views with a lot less data than that. In fact, you know, these are the training requirements for humans to get certified in ECHO, which is a lot more than just finding views. It's about diagnosing disease as well. Um, so clearly humans are more efficient learners by far. Uh, we got interested in how to improve diagnostic imaging for really difficult tasks. And top of that list is detecting structural heart defects uh, from prenatal ultrasound. Um, and there's some reasons that, that this is hard. So despite being the most common birth defect, CHD is still rare enough that physicians, you know, they just don't see enough. They can't hone their skills for CHD detection. It's still only 1% of the population. So uh, at the screening stage, detection rate is still only 30 to 50%. Uh, once someone's referred to a cardiologist, they're fine, but it's that screening stage that is recommended for every pregnancy worldwide where, you know, we're missing the mark a lot of the time and there's simply not enough expertise to deploy at the screening level. Um, and it's because of many things. I mean, the heart is tiny. It beats quite fast. The fetus is moving during all of this and CHD is rare. So, you know, one can understand why this is so hard. Um, and we asked ourselves, you know, facing this, how do we design a machine learning approach that's going to perform well with little data, rare disease, right, and help clinicians on a problem that challenges them, not on a problem that, you know, they don't really need help with. Um, and so what we did here, sorry, my computer's buffering for a minute here. Um, is we decided to downsample so that we had a little more uh, data efficiency going into our models. Instead of using the entire fetal study as an input to our model, it would have been thousands of images per ultrasound study. We made use of clinical guidelines specifying these five axial views uh, of the heart, which are supposed to be able to detect most CHD over 90%. And we hypothesized that this would both allow us to find diagnostic signals for a rare disease using a relatively small data set. Um, but we also did it so that we would found our model on clinical guidelines that were already well studied and already had good buy-in by clinicians. <clears throat> so we broke this problem down into an ensemble of different steps. You'll re recognize this from the neural network zoo. Uh, first, we uh, trained a convolutional neural network, very similar to the cartoon I showed you to distinguish the five cardiac views of interest. Second, uh, we developed binary diagnostic classifiers to determine for each view, was that view normal or not? Third, we used those per view diagnoses to create a composite diagnostic score as to whether the heart overall was normal or not. Um, and then uh, finally, we used fully convolutional networks to calculate beat to beat fetal cardiac measurements from video. Uh, for the classifiers in this project, we use neural network architecture based on ResNet. Uh, and for segmentation, we used a UNet based architecture. Uh, so we tested the view classifier step on fetal screening ultrasound. Uh, and we found that when diagnostic quality target views were present, the view classifier found them with 96% sensitivity and 92% specificity. This table here on the left shows the percent of studies that contained the target view, both what our model felt, thought and what a human expert thought in parentheses. And the gray shading highlights the views that are most important to CHD diagnosis. We'll get into that in a moment. So uh, there are two take home points here. Number one, in general, the model was more uh, lenient in finding views. Uh, than our human experts. Well, it was finding more views. So either it was more lenient in its, its definition of a view uh, or you know, humans being human uh, missed a couple. Um, and number two is that both the model and the human found that recommended views were not always present in each fetal survey. 
Uh, and this is at UCSF, who's excellent at this, right? Um, and they were less commonly present in abnormal studies. Um, so in and of itself, from a QI perspective alone, uh, this is a way we can deploy uh, data science to understand how often guidelines recommended views are actually acquired. So now we've found the five cardiac views. We're gonna use that diagnostic classifier for each view to distinguish normal versus abnormal. So here you got a, some ROC curves from UCSF on the left and an external data set on the right. Um, and so these AUCs range uh, mostly from 0.8 to 0.9, slightly better for the internal test data set than the external test data set. But you know, we, we partnered with Boston Children's Hospital for our external data, very abnormal data set, over 92% CHD. So it was really out there uh, in terms of data distribution. And the one view that doesn't perform so well, this outlier here is this blue line, which represents the abdomen view. Um, and that's actually a good thing because it means that our model is consistent with clinical observations that the abdomen view isn't supposed to be helpful for most CHD. And then finally, you know, we had those views. Uh, now we need to uh, put them all together, right? The composite uh, diagnostic classifier piece here. Uh, so for this, we use a simple rules-based classifier. And I'm showing here the overall AUC, right? Is heart normal or not? On our four test data sets, uh, within here, we've got echocardiogram, and we've got fetal screen ultrasound, we have internal data, we have external data. Um, and what we found on our data set that was most representative of the real world screening situation, a population of 4,000 uh, screening fetal ultrasounds with a real world prevalence of CHD, uh, we have an AUC of 0.99. This is a little, all right. Uh, so we got somewhere, right? Where, where commonly reported sensitivity and specificity for this task can hover below 50% uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, we're doing much better than that. And we show uh, that this performance is robust on over 4.4 million images. So a test set much, much larger uh, than the data set the model was trained on. That indicates robustness. We're really striving to prove robustness at a level that a clinician would trust. Um, not just kind of the minimum that's come up for data science school projects. Um, and we can, absolutely, we need to continue improving. That's what we're doing now. Um, but at least we're gaining confidence that the diagnostic signals that we found here are real. Um, so after we published this paper, this, I don't know, this guy, I don't know who this is, he posted something about our paper on Facebook. Um, and the cool thing about that was that, uh, so probably 90% of the comments are, usual internet trolls, but a lot of the comments actually came from patients and family members of patients who had been through uh, missed diagnoses of uh, congenital heart disease and lived through the consequences of all of that. And they're really excited to get better tools out there. Um, and that really inspires us to, uh, to work harder. So, um, uh, and the other piece of that is that the more you can detect CHD in utero, the more it can be intervened upon in utero, which is a growing uh, area of research in and of itself. Um, so one could end here and say, well, machine learning is really revolutionizing imaging. Now it's ready to take all of our jobs, you know, because we've all seen these headlines. Um, they're all over the place, um, but I would say not so fast. So there's promise for sure uh, that our group and others have shown uh, but there's also some serious limitations to overcome. And I wanna talk about some of those with you because I, I want our physicians to be uh, sophisticated and informer, informed consumers of machine learning and medicine. Uh, but I'll still try to make it fun. So we're gonna have hopefully some, some fun examples as a, a midway through pick me up. Uh, so limitation number one, performance plateau. So as a little exercise, I went to this online text to image generator. You can try this yourself. Um, and then as you see, performance can be limited on some high stakes tasks. Um, and then certainly this is not my idea of normal LB size and function either. 
so yes, they have the disclaimer on their site. This is just for fun. Uh, but it's to illustrate a point on where we are with AI uh, right now for a number of use cases. Uh, we're impressed it got this far. We see some truth in this, right? I mean, it came up with an ultrasound, you know, there's something there. Um, but the performance, there's just not enough truth in it for high stakes medical decisions. Uh, limitation number two, uh, this is an app that's supposed to tell you if an object is a hot dog or not. Don't ask me why, I was bored on the plane, I gave it a try. Uh, so clearly this is good, right? My thumb is not a hot dog, uh, it did well. Uh, but also nobody would say, this is my purse. Uh, my, nobody would say my purse is a hot dog either. Nobody in this audience would do that. So overall performance on this app may be great, I don't know. But then you get these really oddball results on an example that's an absolute no brainer for a human. They would never do this. And so if this is a high stakes medical task, it wouldn't matter if you had a high impact paper reporting this great overall AUC on a large validation cohort. None of that would matter because this type of mistake should never happen. And this type of problem is a real barrier in medical adoption of machine learning. Uh, limitation number three that I'll mention is that neural networks may perform better than other, uh, other types of algorithms, but so far they require a high price and the price is data. They require a lot of data for what they do. Uh, and that might be fine when you're training on cat videos, which as far as I can tell are just in endless supply, um, but it's a real problem in medical imaging. Uh, there's a finite supply of imaging in the world. There's a finite supply of imaging you can get your hands on. You're not sure how representative it is. Um, and all of those things are worse, again, when you're looking at those rare and complex cases that humans need help with the most. So in these ways, uh, some feel, some worry that deep learning is hitting a wall. Um, and it's my, our job, I mean, mine certainly, but hopefully some of you hear this call as well, uh, to try to push past these limitations so that deep learning can really deliver on its promise for medical imaging. Um, so here's some pointers in my humble opinion. Um, the first one is to really think about how to set up the problem that you want computers to solve. Is it worthwhile? Does it make sense? All of that stuff is still the human's job. Um, so this is an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a data science competition. Uh, I was approached to be part of a, a competitor team. Uh, and this was the premise. So we have over half a million cardiac ultrasounds and multimodal data, right? Not just ultrasounds, some other data modality. Um, and this is a really high stakes task. We want you to predict uh, coronary uh, artery disease. So I said, okay, cool, let's look at this. Um, so this is some of the uh, echo that they had. This is some of the echo that they had. Um, this is the multimodal data that they had. So it was structured data in each of these five fields. Uh, and then we looked at the leaderboard and the best teams in the world were getting an AUC of about 0.7. So uh, not bad. Um, and if we were live, I would ask people uh, if they wanted to chime in and, and see what they think of this. But I think, uh, you know, Zoom makes it a little tough. Um, but so I said, you know, I'm gonna decline on this one for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, we're talking about how great it is that we have multimodal data, but ago, um, which makes use of these structured data fields to get a risk score. So, uh, you know, you're talking about multimodal data, you need to be talking about effect modification, that the, the use of both data types is greater than the sum of its parts. That doesn't seem to be true here. Um, and then the second thing, right, is that this heart is a kidney. So uh, that leads me to my next point. Um, you really want to think about your data, clean your data, design your data, right? Because data is half of a machine learning model. We saw that earlier. Uh, and this is, you know, happened here, uh, but this is a bigger problem than you might think. Uh, even in ImageNet, which is a benchmark data set for non-medical images that almost everybody uses to prove their new uh, neural network approach. So even ImageNet thinks that Einstein is a dog, um, as well as this finger thing. I don't know what that is. 
Uh, and we've seen that in the medical side as well. Uh, a lot of the early chest X-ray literature had not been highly reproducible uh, in the beginning, in part due to data problems. Uh, and here's another example. Uh, this is uh, data used to train a machine learning model to classify benign versus malignant skin lesions. Um, so these two, the model classified as benign, it was correct. These two, the model classified as uh, malignant, it was correct, that's great. Um, but there was a problem here. It was a problem actually that a um, colleague of mine, Mike Kaiser's lab, uh, looked at this uh, and it turned out and measured it, these are really faint, but maybe you see that measurement mark, and excised the lesion here. Uh, so it was learning that the dermatologist thought these images were malignant. It wasn't really coming up with an independent decision based on the lesion itself. So right answer for the wrong reason. And some people will say that dirty data is okay, the signal will outweigh the noise, um, but certainly the cleaner your data set is, the more you've thought about what's in there, the better. And above and beyond cleaning, it's really important uh, and incumbent upon us as physicians to make sure data is appropriate to the task at hand, which includes making sure that data is representative of the patients, diseases, and communities that we are trying to serve. Um, and that last anecdote brings me to my third uh, pointer, uh, which is to always interrogate your model's learned features. Um, it's not enough to know your machine learning model is doing the task you want. You want to know that the image features it's using to make its decisions make clinical sense. And I have a, a sense that that's going to really help with that no-brainer, uh, you know, falling down on no-brainer examples uh, problem that we sometimes see. So if you're reviewing machine learning literature, always ask whether the authors have tried to show you what the model has learned. And it's easier for some types of machine learning algorithms than others. People will say, oh, neural networks are the worst. They're a black box. You can't possibly know. Um, but there are still some experiments one can do with neural networks to get a sense of the learned features. So uh, back to our fetal view classifier from the Nature Medicine paper, we calculated these different types of heat maps or, or saliency maps, both of these things, um, that highlight what pixels in the image our model focuses on when it classifies different views of the heart. And we were encouraged to see that it was focusing pretty specifically uh, on the same anatomic structure that clinicians care about. Uh, and there are other types of experiments you can do. Uh, you can do occlusion testing. You can block out the feature that you think is important and see what that does to prediction performance. You can do adversarial testing, like what the prior group did with the scan lesions and the ink markers, you can plop some ink, you know, artificial ink on a benign image and watch that prediction change if it's looking at the wrong thing. So there are things to be, to be done and you should be asking for those. Uh, and then the final pointer here is that we need to free ourselves from human labels, frankly, uh, from labels in general. So in our fetal work, we use supervised learning for every task. Uh, and for all those who label data, I want to take this moment to thank you. It's painstaking, it's time consuming, um, and it's often subjective no matter how good we are. Uh, for example, in the fetal view classifier I was showing you, uh, the model got confused between these two views. These are adjacent views uh, anatomically, 3BT, 3BD. Um, they've also, they've also decided to make it a tongue twister, but, uh, so be it. Um, so we realized that part of the reason the model was confused is because the experts are also confused. So uh, a colleague of mine who knows I'm interested in this stuff was on the writing committee for fetal echocardiogram guidelines and sent me an email thread where the writing committee, uh, them and 15 other experts we're having this discussion on this exact issue, right? What classifies as a 3VT? What classifies as a 3VB? I'm not gonna show you someone's emails, obviously, but that email thread was 42 pages long on just this question. Uh, so in addition to driving humans crazy, 
relying on human labelers creates the potential for baking some ascertainment bias into our models. And we want to avoid that. Um, so in our lab, we're trying to free the human labelers. Um, we return to this task of semantic segmentation of cardiac chambers from ultrasound, so tracing out the chambers from the ultrasound. Um, and uh, I think this audience knows that's critical if you want to measure anything about chamber size and function. Um, and this task has been done to varying degrees. Um, but what we did here is we did this for all four chambers without a single manual label. And we actually did a back of the envelope calculation. Uh, if we had manually labeled our training set, uh, it would have taken a human 2,500 hours. Uh, so here on the left, there's some examples. Uh, we've gotten this to work now. It works pretty well for a textbook image. It works for some abnormal situations like pericardial effusion, you know, creating this fluid pocket here that is initially thought about but then discarded. Uh, it works for uh, pulmonary hypertension, for example, where the ratio of all these chambers is, is uh, out of proportion. And we were able to test here on the right of land almond plot on a huge number of echocardiograms, 40, 40 times more than our training set, more than a human could ever deal with. Uh, we found limits of agreement similar to inter and intra observer measurements on echo, uh, and frankly, simpler, uh, similar to intermodality measurements, you know, echo versus CMR as a gold standard. Um, so, through recognizing these pitfalls and trying to work around them, you know, we and other groups are starting to get more efficient, right? Now we have a low training to test data ratio. Uh, and we've minimized, or in this case, eliminated manual labeling labor. Uh, and if we can do this in ultrasound, as I said, and in rare diseases, then we can do it elsewhere. Uh, on the, uh, uh, let me see here. This, my computer's buffering a form. Okay. Um, and then as we get to this point, you know, the other question about efficiency is how do we choose the right data? to label, well, how do we choose the right data to train on? How do we choose the right data to test on? So we have the best test. Um, that's the most representative of, of future robustness in a larger population. Um, so uh, that part of efficiency is about using math to better understand the structure of our data sets and be able to use math to optimally curate them for training and testing. In medical imaging so far, and this is how we started as well, uh, this is pretty much being done with intuition alone, but we need more systematic ways to analyze and curate the content of medical image data sets. Um, because as we start to collect more medical image data, um, it, it's just gonna be uh, not just unwieldy, but frankly impossible to use it all at once, uh, whether a, a human or a computer. Um, so we started out with this more is better, endless, more is better, more is better. Um, that has a price, and it's actually a crude metric to judge our data sets and our machine learning. Uh, so this is work, we have a, we have a preprint on this, uh, where on the left, we compared image similarity in medical and non-medical image data sets. So non-medical is blue, here the green ones are two different uh, medical data sets. And we find that medical data sets tend to have much more redundancy than non-medical. Uh, we also developed an algorithm to choose the least redundant images for training. Um, and on the right, we have a curve which is, you know, uh, average uh, AUC, so performance by fraction of our data set that we used. Um, and we found that we could get away with using a data set that's just a fraction of the size of the overall data set and get similar performance as if we had used the whole thing. Um, and you know, you take this, it's not exactly what you get at the end, but we have some techniques like data augmentation and other things you can add to that, that'll get you there. So less training data, but smarter training data to decrease labeling effort, to decrease all the burdens that come with data storage, data transfer, and to speed iterative algorithm development. Um, so by now we've understood something about machine learning. We've seen some of its uses in medical imaging that are real, that are happening, very exciting. Um, but we've also seen several uh, pitfalls 
that could hamstring its use for medicine um, and some of the work that we're doing that, that we and others are doing that could lead us through those obstacles. On the computational side, uh, my machine learning colleagues and I are asking for better rigor and reporting, um, but we also need physicians of all backgrounds to get involved. Um, and some of my cardiology colleagues, you know, I'll talk to you about this stuff. I've asked them to review papers, different things, and they'll kind of say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not a data scientist. Like, I don't know if I can really do this. Um, and we wrote this review in Jack uh, last year. I wanna point out that you guys um, can and need to be involved. And there are several roles that physicians can play, whether you get deep into the coding aspects or you're a clinical researcher or a hospital administrator, you name it. Um, so these are some of those things. Um, no matter who you are, please, please um, be a critical consumer of machine learning advancements. Demand rigor and transparency from those developing the models. Um, so if you're gonna use it on your patient, obviously you need to know how it works well enough to trust it. Um, and that can be as a paper or a grant reviewer, that can be as an administrator, uh, evalu evaluating whether the hospital should purchase a new machine learning tool, um, or as a researcher, and please feel free to email me if that interests you. Uh, and we need voices to advocate for responsible sharing of data. Uh, responsible sharing of patient data is like a whole other talk, um, uh, but it's, it's a complex and very, very important issue. Um, and advocate for resources to test, uh, do clinical research testing of new machine learning and to integrate those models into clinical workflows when they've proven themselves. Um, and really the goal of this talk was to give you guys a little bit of the background concepts so that you guys feel empowered to ask these questions and read more if you're not uh, already on your way. Uh, so we've made it to the end. Uh, this is hard work. Uh, it's not like, you know, you just press enter on a computer and everything magically happens. It's, you know, I did basic research uh, before my lab got into this work and it's every bit as slow and painstaking as that. Um, but it's really exciting. And if we can get medical imaging to be more accurate and reproducible, if we can deploy it on these huge registries that we have without even blinking, right, in terms of resources, that becomes amazing. If we, if we get this so that everyone who should have a fetal ultrasound as part of their prenatal care, which is everybody, which is 200 million pregnancies in the world, um, to actually be able to get it and get a good uh, a good reading that doesn't either miss their disease or freak them out with a false positive. I mean, that would really change uh, medicine in a positive way. So um, it's exciting to me uh, when things get hard. I remember how, uh, you know, uh, multidisciplinary collaboration can really drive innovation. So these guys here are Adler and Hertz. Uh, it's when a physician and a physicist came together uh, they were able to create medical ultrasound, which has had a huge impact uh, on for everyone. Um, so thanks very much for listening. Thanks to my own multidisciplinary team, uh, funding sources, and specifically to Bob, uh, Jeff, Atul, uh, Chris, Raphael. Uh, I'm very happy to take some questions. Fabulous, Rima. Thank you. Really interesting topic and very well presented. And uh, for those uh, interested in the Q&A box, please uh, send in questions. Let me start with a few foundational ones. Yeah. Uh, just like the text to imaging thing, and it was probably not the most attractive view of either either of us. <laughs> what is it even using? To, is somebody described in a Twitter feed that I looked like X and it's cueing that, to, or that I did or did not have a mustache, or I am or am not decent looking or whatever? Like, how is it even starting its journey? So I, I think that that tool probably uses uh, one or two things. Um, one is just that, like images from Google, right? Um, and, uh, and the text that goes along with them. So it's a weak label, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. because it's whatever text happens to go with whatever image. Um, and and the, the results change a little bit each time. So I did one of myself before, and the colors in the picture were a little more reminiscent of my, my UCSF profiles picture, frankly. So I could see that it's, it's tro trolling that information um, 
from its training data is probably coming from the web. Okay. Um, I still don't quite understand how unsupervised deep learning works. It feels like, you know, a lot of emphasis on the labeling, it sounds like to get the component parts of, of, the, of the image correct. But at the end of the day, it's got to be sort of figuring out a gold standard answer that it then when you put it up in AUC curve, it's like against that. So in unsupervised, what's the gold standard answer? Um, so there is no gold standard answer, um, but some of the thing, but you're right, there's all, there always has to be some sort of uh, loss function or some sort of error that the algorithm's trying to minimize. Um, sometimes you might just say, you know, uh, um, I want the most distinct clusters. And it'll say, oh, well, to do that, I'm going to need 10 clusters and it's going to be like this. Uh, or you might say, you know, I want two clusters, right? It's a different, different optimization. Then it'll do something different. So those are the types of things that it can optimize to in the absence of a, of a label itself. But, but in the absence of a label that says the gold standard, this is or is not congenital heart disease or, his, or prior MI, is it able to, I mean, can it ultimately get to the right answer without that ultimate gold standard label? In some ways, it's sort of measuring itself against itself. It, it depends what the answer is. So unsupervised learning is not necessarily the way that I would uh, design a CHD detection algorithm. Um, because you think of, gosh, what, uh, you know, if I gave you a stack of ECGs and just said, organize these, mm -hmm. you know, it would take you probably, you know, several hours just to decide, you know, are you going to organize them on whether the paper is pink or black and white in the background? Or are you going to organize it based on what the writing is at the top or, you know, many different tries, many different iterations before you might even assume to organize it by anything about the squiggly line, let right. alone, you know, intervals, duration, amplitude, et cetera. So uh, in some ways, unsupervised is nice because it gets us away from labels, but it can also be one of the more data hungry approaches because you're really, you know, the computer's really planning about, uh, it really doesn't know what to do. That can mm -hmm. both be novel insights, label free or inefficient data hungry. Okay. Um, move to a little more clinical areas and I'll, I see a couple of questions I'll, I'll go into. Um, you mentioned in some ways the, the usual formulation here, because we sort of are rooting for the humans, that, you know, computers and humans are better together and nobody's losing their job anytime yet and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and they're in this particular area of fetal ultrasound, you have a massive access problem that physicians couldn't possibly ever meet. And, you know, a lot of people can't get this to study. But uh, you know, in the end of the day, there probably will be competition between the, uh, the machine acting by itself and an and a expensive, tired, sometimes error-prone human being. So how can we tell that the machine is good enough to, to ditch the human? Yeah, I, I think that comes even, even more than uh, explainability. I think that comes from validation, validation, validation. In that way, it's not so dissimilar from validation for other clinical research purposes. I think the additional things that we can apply for deep learning is some of that adversarial validation. Uh, you know, oh, this looks good. Now let's, you know, uh, put the ink mark on the other skin lesion and see what happens. That type of validation is important. Um, and also not just validating on any old test set, but on a test set where you really designed it to, um, try to encompass all the clinical, socioeconomic, uh, you know, you name it, diversity of what you expect the model to do uh, out in the real world. But at the end of the day, does the, does the model have to be better than humans or as good as humans, but cheaper and more scalable in mm. order to say, we either need Rima down in the echo lab today to oversee and maybe only look at the ones where the computer says, I'm not sure, or mm -hmm. maybe you don't need Rima in the lab because the computer is so good or maybe just as good as you are, but cheaper. Yeah, so what uh, what benchmark do does a computer need to hit before the human is irrelevant? Um, gosh, I mean, I would say it needs to hit the 
I guess I, as a clinician now I'm saying, I think I would, I would want it to hit the best clinician uh, performance possible. And then the difference is, you know, sometimes the best clinician goes to sleep. Sometimes mm -hmm. that gets tired and the machine learning model won't. Mm -hmm. So that would be it's interesting, but as good as the best clinician, not the average clinician. I think so. I mean, why not? Why not search for the best? I think if you're making an impact, so, you know, with the fetal diagnosis, uh, you know, uh, uh, detection can be so low depending on whether or not you're in an expert center, mm -hmm. right? Expert centers are few, pregnancies happen everywhere, um, that we can really make a, a diagnostic impact there, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Let me uh, go to a couple of comments and questions. Jeff Ty said, one example of unsupervised learning clustering gene expression in cancers like mm -hmm. breast cancer, that generated hypothesis for different underlying types of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's not making the diagnosis per se, but generates hypothesis based on the, the patterns. Yeah. Uh, Seth Bloomberg asked, thanks for the fascinating talk. In the next 10 years, machine learning for medical imaging will have the most impact in high or low resource centers. Huh, that is interesting. I think my, my initial, my 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 gut answer was going to be low resource settings because there you know there are places that don't have anything and then you're able to bring in something, um, but I think even in high resource settings, right, there are still uh, you know there's still variability in in how we read. We still have scalability issues and we still want to reduce healthcare costs. And if machine learning can help us do that, that's important for high resource settings as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it could go either way. I, I agree with you on the latter, that even in a high resource setting, you still have the, the weekend in the middle of the night problem. You still have, um, you know, very expensive, you know, clinical resources that if you're being pressured in a meaningful way to figure out how to save money and do it safely, either not having the clinical person there or having a clinical person there, but to be a, the adjudicator when the machine's not sure feels like the kind of sensibility and infrastructure you need to kind of get started may be there first. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the use case in low resource centers is, is tremendous because you're there, you're competing against nothing in some ways, you're, you're, you're filling a huge gap. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I think yeah. that one, one thing that's gonna be needed uh, in all of these cases, and maybe especially in high resource settings, is an ability to follow the money through the hospital because you know no outcomes, no income, as they say, um, and you you want to be able to prove or prove to somebody that this is you know improving outcomes, saving money, both. And you know even even in our hospital, I, I find it hard to know you know how much an ultrasound costs. I know how much this insurer reimburses for it. I know right. how much we charge for it. I know a lot of things about it, but not exactly like what it costs. Right. Um, and and so that's really about uh, infrastructure of a lot of different kinds of data in in healthcare. Uh, in, including the uh, healthcare utilization data as well. Yeah, and how much it costs, in some ways the more relevant question is, do we get paid to do it or mm -hmm. are we getting paid a fixed amount of money to take care of a heart patient? In which yeah. case, if we can make it cost less, the system saves money. Hmm. Um, how important is the story, the patient's story? And by that, I mean, when you read an echo, you probably get a little description of a patient history. Maybe the clinician comes down and says, Rima, I'm trying to figure out what's going on here and see whether the patient really is in heart failure or not and whatever. Um, and I'm guessing in kind of a Bayesian way, when you look at the image, you have that story in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we need the human because theoretically the computer could read, quote, read the chart. Yep. But how important, when, when you look at the reading, I'm assuming it's just a pure technical reading of, you know, what it looks like for the squeeze, but how important is integrating the patient's background information and substrate in, in this? And does that give the humans an advantage here? I think it does give humans an advantage. Um, and I think it's very important as a clinician. Uh, we absolutely look for those little, uh, you know, reason for study uh, information that you guys give us when we order. Um, but exactly as you say, that's just a multimodal data problem. That's just a network or, a, or a, a set of networks that inputs the image and inputs that, that text information or however you want to however you want to represent it to a computer. Um, and I think there's there's a couple things. So 
it's it's important on the input end, right? I'm looking at this echo. Why am I looking at this echo? Tell tell me what I'm looking for, you know. Um, but but also at the output end, okay. I've seen this picture. I've seen this picture. I've seen this picture. How does this uh, how does this hang together? What does mm -hmm. this mean, mm -hmm. right? And so that uh, you know, uh, one of the fun things I get to do is read in the echo, do research, then read in the echo lab and think about how my brain does this and how do I teach folks? And then how does a computer's brain do this? And how do we teach the computers and kind of compare and contrast? Um, definitely there's there's like a logic box happening. Um, you know, you find this, you find this, you find this. Now, how do you combine those features into a logic of yep. what's going on in the part? Um, yeah. And that's absolutely why uh, ensembling different algorithms together, different neural networks, uh, or one neural network, one decision, you know, simple decision tree, that's going to be important in getting us to uh, answers that patients and providers actually care about. Yeah, uh, yeah, not just a lot. I mean, it's not just the logic box, but the communication yeah. box that you're awesome. taking that, you know, at least right now, I would think the human's better at taking what the image is technically and communicating with a fellow clinician about what it means and having a conversation on a good day about sort of what, what should be the next step that's be harder for computers to pull off. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it will come over time, but um, yeah, pure image analysis alone isn't gonna give that clinical decision-making, but that's why I think physicians can be such a powerful part of this process um, in terms of experimental design. Yeah. Uh, anonymous attendees, thank you for your talk, exclamation point. Uh, I'm wondering, where do you see the most promising and probable accomplishments with machine learning in cardiac imaging? So sort of practically, you mentioned a few areas where it's already kind of here, and it may just be that as an end user, you don't know it, that that's where it came from. But sort of as you, as you scope over the next five or 10 years, where do you think this really will have a meaningful clinical impact? Yeah, I mean, I think it's already having an impact in terms of measurements, in terms of view recognition and guidance. That's that's already happening. Um, and then, you know, measurement in the beginning was just all about LVEF, LVEF, LVEF. Mm -hmm. um, and we get called down in the echo lab and we want to explain this whole story about the echo and they just want to know what's the EF. Because that's um, the most tractable problem or <laughs> that's the their algorithm of do, of, of do A versus B hinges on an EF above or below 40% or something? Uh, I think it's because it's the most tractable uh, problem. So mm -hmm. I think that measurement is going, those, those measurements are going to uh, give way to, you know, all four chambers as we're doing, to valves, uh, we're interested in that as well, uh, to, a, to a lot more things and, and hopefully then help us to the, to the person talking about hypothesis generation um, can potentially help us discover novel subcategories of image features that then we can go on and study and say, hey, uh, this is different from this. Does that make a difference in terms mm -hmm. of, of prognosis or, or management? Okay. Uh, just time for a couple more. The, the advantage of scale, you mentioned that there's a lot of inefficiencies and one of the things your lab is doing is trying to sort of figure out maybe we can get away not needing a trillion scans to, to come up with the right reason. You know, one of the things we talk about is, you know, UCSF is part of the UC health system. We're all combining our data, which gives us 5X scale. How useful is that or, or 1X is good enough for most clinical problems? Um. I, I mean, I, I'm a huge proponent and, and I think helper uh, to some extent with that process. So agree there, but um, it's just not, it's not sustainable. And then there'll be some hospital in Africa, which will say, oh yeah, UC Health, who cares? My hospital data is not in there. Um, and that's how many hospitals do we have in how many countries? Like that will just continue to happen. Mm. Um, and there's just, you know, until the entire earth gets in on this thing, uh, we we can always have that problem of saying, oh, our test data set is just a sample and we've missed something in our data distribution. Um, and that's where I'm an advocate of a little bit more information theory applied to uh, test and training sets. We'll still have the test set, um, but uh, you know, don't necessarily have to test on the entire world's data every time to know that we're, uh, we've achieved robustness. 
Okay, last question, uh, 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 admittedly obnoxious question. Uh, if you had a child who was 10, said I wanted to be a doctor, and then said, I think I want to be an echocardiography re reader mm -hmm. or a radiology, diagnostic radiologist, so 20 year time horizon, would you discourage that person from that career feeling like there will or won't be humans doing those things? Ah, well, I did have a cousin who was 11 who wanted to be a radiologist. Yeah. And I told her, cool, but also learn to program. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> because there's, there's still going to be, you know, there's still going to be imaging specialists and clinical specialists of all kinds, but we can't accept the computational solutions for our work blindly. Mm -hmm have to be able to know, you know, be educated enough to know what they mean and how they work enough to question or to test. Uh, so that I think is the piece. And listen, our, our skills uh, as physicians are going to change. They've changed in the past um, and they'll continue to do so. And I, I tell people, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're all kind of worried, oh, is this gonna take my job? But that's not the oath we made, right? The oath we made is to do the best for the patient. If that means that my job is no longer to read echoes in the same way, like that, I may or may not like that, but I'm going to have to accept it in some way. I mean, it's, you know, um, general cardiologists used to do uh, left heart cats, and then people realize that the better, uh, the better use is to have a subspecialty trained person doing that. So some general cardiologists had to get out of that business. And, and that's just always going to be uh, that's just part of being a physician. The fact that there's this very hyped solution right now or that it seems to be happening at a faster pace right now, that's just, you know, that's just the trend of the day. It's yeah, not incarnation. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to end, I think. Thank yeah. you so much for this and for your work in this area. It's really exciting and it'd be fun to watch and uh, be well. We'll see you back here next week.